Welcome everyone. I'm Professor Jonathan Barrett from the University of Leicester in the UK and we've got a great panel and a great uh, ES seminar session uh, for you this afternoon. This is the second in a series of e-seminars that are covering anemia management of chronic kidney, in chronic kidney disease patients. And today we're going to focus on the impact of anemia management on quality of life in CKD patients. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to introduce the panel, starting with Roberto Minitolo. So Roberto, would you like to tell the, the listeners uh, a little bit about your practice? Uh, yeah, first of all, good, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Thank you to IRA for this kind of invitation. Uh, uh, I am associate professor at the University of Campania in Italy, and my clinical activity is mainly dedicated to the uh, management of non-dialysis CKD patients referred to our uh, uh, clinic. Thank you, Roberto. And Martin, would you like to let everyone know a little bit about yourself? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Martin de Borst. I'm a consultant nephrologist at the University Medical Center in Groningen in the Netherlands. So that's the northern part of the Netherlands. And um, I'm also an adjunct professor of uh, cardiorenal medicine uh, with a particular interest in uh, bone mineral abnormalities, but also in uh, renal anemia. Thank you. And last, but by no means least, Sapna. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm a consultant nephrologist at King's College Hospital in London. I've been here for about 15 years now. I'm the clinical lead for transplantation and I look after a cohort of uh, CKD patients as well. And I'm also the uh, lead for clinical research for renal at King's. Great, thank you. And just to remind the viewers, please don't hesitate to ask questions using the Q&A button, and we will have a, a lively discussion after Roberto's talk. So with uh, no more ado, I'm going to hand over to Roberto to kick us off with a, a, a lecture covering uh, the impact uh, of anemia management on quality of life. So thank you, Roberto. Uh, so today we will talk about uh, uh, the impact of anemia on uh, uh, quality of life of the CKD patients. Um, this is my disclosures, and uh, this is the uh, the outline of uh, of my presentation. I will start with talking about uh, the uh, tools that we have for assessment of quality of life. After, I will show you some uh, data from observational studies, a randomized trial about uh, the relationship between quality of life and either hemoglobin levels and our status. Then I will quickly, quickly show you some uh, uh, initial data about uh, the uh, use of uh, new anime drugs, uh, that is uh, the if produced hydroxylase uh, inhibitors and quality of life. Uh, 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 I will close uh, discussing about uh, a limitation of a quality of, uh, uh, of live assessment in uh, daily clinical practice and clinical studies. Um, the most uh, one of the most frequent uh, uh, frequently used questionnaire for evaluation of quality of life is the kidney disease quality of life 36 it is derived from uh, a larger questionnaire including more than 130 questions and it provides information on five domains the physical activity mental components the burden of kidney kidney disease uh, symptoms and problems of kidney disease and the effects of, uh, of renal disease on the daily life. Uh, it is, uh, we, we have also the possibility to derive a, a physical and mental score. So just these two uh, subscales uh, using a, a shorting questionnaire, the so-called SF12. Uh, this uh, questionnaire includes uh, uh, 12 questions about uh, uh, among the original 36 of the complete questionnaire that focusing uh, specifically on these uh, two aspects, physical and mental uh, components. The SF12 has been uh, validated in, uh, uh, in hemodialysis patients, also in non-dialysis patients, but you can see that there is a, 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 an excellent correlation between uh, the score obtained with the uh, SF12 with, uh, the, lar uh, with the, the scores of the tent uh, with the larger uh, uh, questionnaire. And also from uh, a prognostic uh, point of view, you can see there is a, 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 
a perfect uh, uh, overlap between uh, the prognostic role uh, estimated with the uh, SF12 and that obtained with the SF36. A second uh, frequently used uh, uh, questionnaire is the European quality of life of five dimensions. Uh, this questionnaire explores the effects of disease on mobility, on self-care, usual activity, pain, and depression. Patients are asked to uh, uh, grade the impact of uh, uh, disease on, uh, on uh, these five uh, domains. Uh, from uh, absent uh, to uh, severe. In the second part of, uh, of the questionnaire, the patient is asked to uh, indicate on a, a visual analog scale ranging from zero to 100, uh, which is the uh, perception of uh, uh, his own health uh, today when, when he completes the, the, the questionnaire. Uh, this allows uh, uh, a numerical assessment of the patient per perception of uh, uh, quality of life. And of course, uh, the uh, higher numbers indicate uh, uh, a better uh, quality of life. This visual analog scale is useful when you want to compare over time the, uh, the changes of quality of life uh, in uh, your patients. There are also some other uh, questionnaire indicated here. These are um, less frequently used in, uh, in the reported in clinical trials. What is important to remember for all this questionnaire and that uh, none of these has been created to specifically examine anemia of CKD. And they were not developed using uh, inputs from uh, patients with uh, anemia of CKD. Now, uh, move on the uh, relationship between, uh, between hemoglobin levels and quality of life. All of you are aware that uh, there is a strict relationship between uh, hemoglobin and uh, uh, all the, the, the single domains of quality of life. This is a study, a post-hoc analysis of a prospective study in over uh, 1,000 on dialysis anemic patients uh, receiving uh, erythropoietin uh, uh, weekly. Uh, in this study, uh, la, the assessment of quality of life uh, was uh, performed three times in the first 16 weeks. And you can see that there is a, uh, a progressive improvement of, uh, uh, of all domains of quality of life uh, as uh, hemoglobin increases. This is particularly true for uh, uh, physical symptoms, that is the, the green line here, and the fatigue uh, sub, sub, subscale indicated by the uh, black line. These observations have been confirmed, these results have been confirmed uh, more recently in this uh, uh, larger study, including more than uh, 5,000 CKD patients, one third of which receiving hemodialysis enrolled uh, in uh, seven countries. You can see that uh, the uh, non-dialysis, the association between uh, uh, hemoglobin level and quality of life score, in this case was the visual analog score derived for uh, EQ5D, uh, this association was, uh, was stricter for non-dialysis patients. It is uh, occurred uh, independently from uh, CKD stage, while uh, the association between uh, hemoglobin and quality of life was significantly weaker in uh, hemodialysis patients. Same results uh, were reported uh, uh, by using a different questionnaire. And also in this case, you can see the stronger association between hemoglobin and uh, quality of life in non-dialysis versus dialysis uh, uh, subjects. Once again, for all the five uh, components of, uh, of uh, the questionnaire. An interesting point of the study is the evaluation of uh, impact of anemia on working activity and uh, productivity. This is a further aspect of quality of life. Uh, this is particularly important, of course, for uh, uh, those uh, uh, in uh, working uh, uh, age, for uh, patients in, uh, in working age. With this specific uh, uh, questionnaire, you can uh, assess three uh, aspects. That is uh, absenteeism, 
defined as work time missed due to impairment, in this case it's CKD. The presenteism, that is the ability to function at work while being impaired. And uh, overall work uh, impairment uh, that measure this measured as a uh, patient reported hours missed due to impairment. In non dialysis patients, you can see get the absenteism, presenteism, and uh, overall work impairment uh, are uh, much higher in uh, patients with more severe anemia, with uh, a progressive reduction uh, of, of these three aspects when uh, uh, hemoglobin is better controlled. The same occurred in dialysis patients. Of course, the, the uh, work impairment is higher in, uh, in dialysis than in non-dialysis patients, likely because of a higher burden of uh, comorbidities. But uh, the relationship between uh, uh, absenteism, presenteism, and uh, uh, missed hours remains according to uh, the, the, the strata of uh, hemoglobin levels. Now, the, the, the data I previously showed uh, are, are all derived from uh, observational studies. And uh, you know that uh, for their experimental design, uh, observational studies can only demonstrate an association between hemoglobin level and quality of life, but they cannot prove a cause-effect relationship. Therefore, to, to answer the question, if a correction anemia translates in an improvement of quality of life, uh, we need data from a randomized controlled trial. Unfortunately, the, the number of, uh, of uh, this kind of trials in the field of anemia of CKD are very few, and the quality of life in all these trials is always, is, uh, always considered as a secondary end point. Uh, the, the, the complexity of this uh, association is further testified by when looking at uh, the results of this trial that are conflicting. If you look at the uh, CREATE trial, the, first, the one of the, the, the three mega trial in non-dialysis patients, you can see that there is a, a significant improvement in all quality of life the, the domains in patients receiving uh, epoitin beta targeted to achieve higher hemoglobin level. When we look at the three trial comparing darbepoietin or uh, placebo, you can see intermediate results. That is uh, uh, the, the improvement in the fatigue score, energy and physical score are uh, inconsistent and uh, 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 in particular, they are modest from a clinical point of view, even though uh, statistically significant. And the third trial, QUART trial, was a negative trial because no significant improvement in any quality of life domains was detected in patients randomized to 13.5 uh, hemoglobin compared to those randomized to 11.3. These latter negative results have been also uh, confirmed in a, a meta-analysis of uh, uh, 17 trials uh, involving uh, more than uh, 1,000 uh, uh, patients, 24% of these receiving renal replacement therapy. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, the, the high hemoglobin level did not improve any of these uh, uh, single domains. The, the, the results were consistent when uh, non-dialysis and dialysis population were analyzed separately. More recently, uh, uh, a second meta-analysis uh, specifically evaluated the, the association, the effect of uh, anemia control on uh, uh, two aspects of quality of life, that is physical function and uh, fatigue. You can see that uh, they confirm that uh, in terms of physical function domain, there is no significant improvement when uh, uh, you correct hemoglobin at higher level. Conversely, when looking at the fatigue domain, there is a significant effect that is uh, much more pronounced and significantly higher in uh, patients who uh, ra were randomized and achieve an hemoglobin level above 13 as compared with those uh, uh, achieving uh, hemoglobin level below 
the 13 gram per deciliter. This uh, results has been uh, also uh, has been further analyzed with the meta regression analysis, showing that uh, 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 the improvement in the fatigue score is particularly relevant in uh, non diabetic patients and uh, in younger subjects. What about uh, the, the data on quality of life uh, and iron status? Well, this is a, a, a study, the CKD DOC study. 2,500 non-dialysis patients uh, uh, followed in Brazil, France, and the USA. Uh, the, the, the two outcome, uh, uh, primary outcome of, about quality of life was uh, where uh, uh, physical component summary and mental component summary. Patients were stratified according to a different level of transferrin saturation and uh, ferritin. And you can see that uh, lower transferrin saturation associates with the worse or quality of life, physical activity in particular. And the same occurred also for patients with either lower or higher ferritin level. No association was found between these two parameters and the uh, mental component summary. When uh, combining these two parameters, transferrin saturation and, uh, and, uh, transfer and uh, ferritin, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the significant association with the worse quality of life of uh, physical components in terms of physical components persist in patients with absolute iron deficiency, that is with the transferrin saturation below 20 and ferritin below 15, but it's also significant uh, in uh, patients with uh, low transfer saturation and uh, ferritin uh, higher than 300 that roughly corresponded to the definition of a function iron deficiency. What about the randomized trial? In this case, also in this case, in the case of, uh, of iron supplementation, the results were negative. This is the pivotal trial. 2000, more than 2,000 hemodialysis patients receiving uh, intravenous iron at high dose versus low dose. And you can see that uh, uh, the, the quality of life uh, assessed with two different questionnaires did not change in the, in the two groups. A similar findings has been also reported uh, in uh, this smallest randomized trial, the IRON and EARTH study, uh, 56 patients uh, with the isolated iron deficiency, that is a, a tra low transfer saturation and or ferritin, uh, low ferritin levels, but in the presence of hemoglobin above 11. These patients were randomized to receive intravenous uh, uh, iron versus placebo. Uh, you can see, once again, physical domain, mental domain, vitality domain, there is no change between uh, uh, patients receiving iron versus placebo. And of course, the same occurred uh, uh, when, uh, when uh, evaluating the, the total score. The new anemia drugs, uh, if prolyl hydroxylate inhibitors, uh, by providing a comprehensive anemia correction, including not only the simulation of endogenous erythropoietin, but also uh, the improvement of iron metabolism uh, uh, should have at least uh, theoretically a greater impact on quality of life. Uh, this is testified in this very recent trial published a few weeks ago on Kidney International, uh, in which 614 non dialysis patients were randomized to the Prodostat or uh, placebo. You can see that the Prodostat is effective in increasing hemoglobin with a larger number of, uh, of uh, uh, patients responder in terms of uh, uh, hemoglobin increase. And uh, this, uh, this is the, the effect on quality of life, uh, uh, in particular on vitality score. You can see that there is a progressive increase in the patients receiving the Prodostat, while there is a substantial uh, constant values in a uh, in, uh, uh, placebo group. At the end of the study, there is a, a, a significant difference between two groups that on average is uh, uh, above five points. And uh, of note, these uh, favorable results of, uh, of the products that were consistent across uh, uh, different subgroups considered. 
Uh, this is a study against placebo. What about uh, uh, studies uh, uh, against the standard therapy? So uh, this is a, uh, a table that reports uh, the uh, 24 phase three randomized trial comparing different uh, uh, if PHI versus uh, active uh, uh, comparator, either darbepoietin or repoietin. And you can see as of the, 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 the first uh, uh, point to underline that is only four studies evaluated the clean, uh, evaluated quality of life. And uh, of these four studies, three of these the, the show the no between arm change in uh, quality of life. Uh, my last point relates to the limitation of quality of life uh, assessment. So the, the, I think that the, 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 the first uh, uh, factor that limits a wide implementation of, of the, the use of questionnaire in daily clinical practice is represented by time constraints. So this is particularly true for, uh, for those renal clinics in which there is a, a higher referral rate in large dialysis center, but also in those countries in which there is a low number of nephrologists. In addition, there are some uh, common belief among nephrologists that may also limit a wider adoption of, uh, of quality of life assessment. Um, the, the, the first is that uh, uh, we, we, we treat a, a, a very high risk population with, a, with a, a, an heavy burden of comorbidities. And, and, and sometimes we believe that the symptoms uh, are uh, in some way expected in a so high risk population, and therefore they are uh, uh, tolerated or uh, uh, under recognized. Uh, the second point to consider is uh, the uh, uh, low attitude of, uh, of nephrologists to uh, reconcile patients' needs with uh, uh, our prescription. And the third, I think, uh, uh, maybe the, the most important is the, the different perception of, of what, which outcome are really relevant between patients and the nephrologist. This point has been highlighted in, the, in, the, in these studies uh, carried out in seven dialysis units in Canada and four in Australia in which uh, uh, patients and uh, doctors were uh, interviewed to identify the priorities for outcomes. You can see that for, for, uh, from a, a patient's per perspective, the, the, the most important factors are uh, fatigue energy, survival, and ability to travel. While uh, hard outcomes, such as mortality, that are uh, very relevant for, uh, for nephrologists, uh, is just at the 14th place in the in the ranking of patients. So I think this suggests that uh, for our patient is more important how they live rather than how long they live. A further key aspect to consider is the interpretation of results from uh, from questionnaire. Uh, this slide shows you uh, an analysis of Crick study. Uh, uh, you can see here the, the, the predicted change in uh, uremic symptom severity score associated with uh, uh, five milliliter minutes decline in uh, EGFR. You can see that there is a progressive uh, uh, worsening of, uh, of uh, uh, symptom severity score, particularly in patients with more advanced CKD. However, please note that this is a this score range from zero to 100. So if we try to uh, report these results on the correct scale, you can see that uh, the, the changes uh, with the, with the uh, five associated with the five with wor worsening of uh, of GFR decline are very small. In fact, the large majority of Crick participants, more than 85 percent of patients. Uh, reported uh, uh, stable condition with the, the, the proportion of, uh, of uh, uh, those worsening that is equal to the, the, the proportion of patients in which there is a, an improvement. 
A last point that I would underline uh, uh, also related to the interpretation of, uh, of changes of quality of life. Uh, there are three aspects that should be uh, uh, more clearly defined. The first is uh, the minimal detectable change, so which is the smallest change in score that we can detect beyond the measurement error. The second point, even more important, I think, is uh, which is the smallest change in score which patients perceive as important. And the third is the response shift. Response shift is uh, 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 the, the take into account that the condition, the, the, the symptoms, the clinical uh, comorbidities of patients can, can change over time. So uh, uh, what we evaluate now with the, with the questionnaire, uh, uh, not necessarily is relevant for patients after six or 12 months, because uh, eventual modification in either clinical conditions or patient needs. Therefore, the changes over time associated with treatment, for example, anemia treatment, can be masked by a change in a patient's priority. Uh, this was my last slide. Uh, I thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. So thank you, Roberto, for a really fascinating talk. I think this is a highly complex area that is really challenging to get to grips with. And you've hit on a number of the really important points there in terms of how we actually measure quality of life. Quality of life changes over the natural history of kidney disease and the transition to dialysis. Yeah. For me, the value of what is a change on a scale does that clinic you know we know things can be statistically significant but does that actually have clinical relevance does that make a difference to patients and that's something that i think is really challenging but before i go on i i'm going to pass the baton over to martin now for his initial thoughts on your presentation and any questions he might have for you about this area martin yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, and um, thank you, Roberto, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I was particularly uh, impressed by the uh, interesting finding from the study from Joe Hanson and Kidney International on the effect of the FPHI um, on uh, quality of life. And um, as you mentioned, this was, of course, compared against placebo. And it's also important to mention, I think, that uh, the SF. Uh, 36 vitality score was uh, the main focus of this study, which consists in fact only of four questions out of the 36 of the SF36. Um, having said that, I think it's still uh, important to note that uh, um, the FPHI was indeed able to uh, result in an improvement uh, uh, in this score. Um, I was wondering because of course this was uh, compared against placebo. Um, uh, would this be like the effect on the hemoglobin, uh, which was also, of course, uh, increased in response to treatment uh, that, that drove the uh, effect on quality of life? Or would it be really a specific effect of the HIF-PHI? What, what, what were your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, uh, this is a very, very good question because, uh, 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 you know, the, when, when you compare an active drug with, versus placebo, of course, this is the first question uh, that arises. Uh, we cannot exclude that uh, this is mainly due to the uh, improvement in hemoglobin levels, because uh, as you remember, there is a difference inter between the two groups of 1.4 gram per deciliter, that is uh, a substantial change. Uh, but I, I agree with you that this study by Johnson is, uh, is relevant also, uh, because there are very few data on the quality of life with these new drugs. And I, 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 when I prepared the table, I was very surprised for this because uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, one expect that uh, if you use a drug acting uh, in a more physiological way, you should also have a, a greater impact on the, on the quality of life. But unfortunately, this has been, has been uh, assessed very, very uh, in, in few studies. Thank you. And and Sapno, do just what are your top level thoughts on on this complete area, really, and, and what Roberto has been talking about? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I mean, I completely agree, Roberto. Great talk. Thank you very much for drawing that all together. And um, I think for me, what struck me is 
that there is so much that we know about anemia and quality of life. And then there is so much that we don't know about anemia and quality of life. And, you know, Roberta, I was struck in your early slides, you were very careful to say the association uh, between anemia and quality of life. And when hemoglobin is higher, patients report a better quality of life. Um, and so we don't even know really based on what you're saying there, whether, you know, increasing the hemoglobin uh, by whichever treatment is that going to be beneficial to our patients or is it just the fact that because anemia is a confounding you know a factor in this um intuitively i think as you know nephrologists looking after patients with anemia and ckd we feel that treating their anemia should improve their quality of life and it's slightly disheartening not to find the data to support that um and i suppose that makes me think you know why why is that um is it is it because we haven't got the right quality of life uh, questionnaires. We're not asking the right questions. Are they not bespoke enough for our anemia patients? Um, is it the design of uh, the clinical trials? And I, you know, the point you make about them being, sec you know, an afterthought, uh, a secondary outcome, if you like, in some of the clinical trials, you know, that is likely, um, uh, you know, to, to, to be very, um, uh, to be pertinent uh, in, in this analysis. Um, and, you know, I think like you and uh, Martin, I was hoping that we might be able to answer the question, does treatment of anemia with an ESO or a HIF stabilizer, can we say one is better or not on quality of life? And I, I don't think we're in a position to say that at the moment. What we haven't looked at, of course, is the burden um, of treatment itself in, and compare that. We're just looking at the quality of life as aspects. I suppose to, to sort of finish what, what, um, what, I, what I'm thinking about it, I think that whatever, whatever we can take away from here, I think we, what we're really saying is that quality of life is now moving into the center stage for patients and for clinicians. And what you say about patients not necessarily focusing on living longer, but just living better resonates. That's what patients say to me in, in clinics. And I think we really need to take note of that um, and start thinking about our the way we design our research studies, the, the way we approach our patients in clinic. So very thought provoking. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I just touching on that, because I think that's a really important point in terms of the shift from a number, a haemoglobin value to how the patient actually feels and functions. And uh, and I wonder whether we might just touch on the song initiative. I, I, I guess most of us have been involved in that. And for those who don't know, who are listening in, the song initiative is a fantastic initiative looking at standardized outcomes in nephrology, uh, crossing across a whole range of different areas from rare glomerular disease through to dialysis to uh, children. And it's really asking patients, what would they like to have measured to show that a treatment is effective? <laughs> And uh, and I know Roberto, have you been involved in the in the song initiative? Certainly, a, a, no, a, no. But I, I wonder if Sapner or Martin, you have been involved. But uh, but certainly, there's been a complete discordance. That that graph you showed about it, mortality being incredibly important for nephro nephrologists, but actually, patients don't want to live a long, miserable, low quality life. They and certainly in the the studies I've seen, it's about life participation. It's about being able to have a quality of life that means they can spend time with their family. They can uh, continue employment if that's what's important. And that's what patients want to have measured. And if we did that, I think we'd probably make a very challenging situation <laughs> for us to show drugs are effective. Um, because I think a number of you have touched on the fact we've got confounders here, haven't we? We've got the impact of increasing hemoglobin in the setting of a patient that has progressive kidney impairment, symptoms, worsening symptoms of uremia, an increasing medication load, mm. uh, all the other cardiovascular comorbidity, all these things that are competing out the improvement in quality of life we might have expected to see. Um, and certainly when you get onto dialysis, life is so challenging that it's really difficult to show an improvement. Um, and uh, I wonder, Roberta, how do we take that into account? How can we, we look at that uh, to try and tease out the impact of quality of life and remove those other confounders? How do you think we might be able to approach that? I, I think it's very, very difficult to remove the confounders. 
but I try to 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 provide a suggestion for translating it also for those say that uh, Sapna said be, be, before. Uh, uh, how can we translate the, the the data from clinical trials to our clinical practice? So first, I think it, it is important to consider uh, in which patients you want uh, fully correct anemia. Uh, 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 maybe those uh, the younger, maybe younger patients, uh, those with uh, active life, because these these patients are those who more benefit for uh, for anemia correction. And the second point I think is important to, to balance the risk for uh, for uh, uh, I associated with a higher hemoglobin level is uh, how do you correct this anemia? So which is the dose of ISA required for achieve that uh, hemoglobin level? If uh, if patients with the low comorbidity burden uh, obtain uh, uh, 12, 12.5, also 13, but with the very small ESA doses, maybe the risk of adverse event in these patients is very, very small. And so uh, uh, in this case, you can balance more the, the advantage in terms of quality of life versus uh, the, the potential risk associated with the, with the treatment. Uh, the other point to consider is also, uh, as, as you mentioned before, it's very difficult for uh, uh, dialysis patients because uh, when you, for example, when you want to analyze the uh, visual analog scale, so the problem is uh, 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 if a patient's move for, from, uh, I mean, 70 to 75, there is an increase in five points, probably patients is not aware of this uh, improvement. While a patient who is uh, with a, a, a basal score of uh, 20, 25, and reach the same increase of five points, uh, reach 30, probably probably it's uh, 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 perceived much more this uh, this increase. But to date, we don't have uh, the, 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 uh, an answer to this uh, to this uh, uh, question, and don't have the the adequate tool for uh, evaluates this uh, this kind of difference. No, I think that's very true. And I'm going to come to Martin now because you have a very strong interest in cardio-renal. And of course, you can't measure correction of anemia without thinking of the heart, can you, and the vascular system in terms of the adverse events. How do you square the circle in terms of potentially giving a drug that we want to to increase improve the quality of our patients' lives because patients with advanced kidney disease do have poor quality of life often? against that cardiovascular risk that is always in the back of our mind from the TREATS trial and the other trials there of EPO. What, where, how is your thought process when you're looking at that patient in front of you? But, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Da -da. Please, please, Martin. Sorry. Yeah, I was, um, uh, I, I agree with you, Roberto, because you were referring to that already uh, previously. I think that um, you have to, uh, individualized treatment and look at which patient could potentially um, be accepted for a little bit higher hemoglobin value uh, to improve quality of life. Uh, but still, of course, this was also in the back of my mind during your presentation, because this uh, this line uh, showing the relationship between hemoglobin value and quality of life that was more or less like linear in your presentation uh, uh, also told me that um, uh, so uh, how should we go beyond the upper limits of the uh, what we would normally um, uh, uh, focus on in, in correcting hemoglobin, like uh, uh, 12, 13, uh, how, how high can we go? Uh, and would that be in conflict with what we consider safe? And I think there might be a small subgroup of patients where we can accept that, but for the majority, I would still be very careful because, uh, well, basically of the principle of do not harm, uh, even though the patient might um, actually uh, have a preference to um, to have better quality of life and accept a higher risk of mortality, perhaps even. For me as a doctor, that would still be a conflict. Yeah, and I, so I'm gonna give you a difficult question here. So we know cardiologists and heart failure doctors specifically have been looking at correction of anemia as a way of improving quality of life. How do you, and we know that correcting anemia and intravenous iron may well improve cardiac function. So why are we seeing this increased cardiovascular risk when in, patient, in chronic kidney disease patients, when in the heart failure population, we're actually seeing 
a positive effect uh, in those particular, what is it peculiar about CKD you think that is bringing this cardiovascular risk to this correction of anemia, certainly with erythropoietins? Yeah, not sure about the specific factors that are, are at play here, but uh, of course there are uh, clear differences between the populations of heart failure patients and, and CKD population. And probably it's somewhere in there where the, the answer to your question lies. And uh, I was also um, a little bit disappointed by the data that you showed, Roberto, on uh, the disappointing effects of correcting iron deficiency on, on quality of life in CKD population, which is also in contrast with what we saw in the, in the very large heart failure trials, mm. which uh, contained actually a lot more patients, like thousands of patients in, in those trials as compared to the, well, somewhat smaller, of course, there was the, um, the pivotal trial, which is the largest uh, so far, uh, but with a disappointing result. And I was wondering if that could be due to differences in the, in the, in the population and whether that is vascular calcifications or, or other comorbidities that are more frequent in, in CKD patients than in, uh, in the heart failure population. Uh, to me, that is still a question, but this apparently seems to play a role. And uh, that's perfect segue to SAPNA because uh, based at King's uh, and the pivotal study was driven out of King's. And I was going to come on to that iron story. So SAPNA, that's, I have to say my clinical practice in the pre-dialysis population, I do see, see patients coming in feeling much better after a dose of intravenous iron. But clearly the date, pivotal was a hemodialysis study again, but clearly the data does make us question that, you know, clinical anecdote. What is your interpretation of quality of life and intravenous iron from, uh, from your understanding? So I, I think it comes back to, again, how are we looking at this data? So I think that, you know, the pivotal study, as Roberta showed, didn't show any improvement in quality of life. But that, again, is in our hemodialysis patients. And we know quality of life has some, there are so many other impacts on quality of life for our dialysis patients. Um, and I think that is a, you know, that's a very strong factor there. I too, you know, I agree in the non-dialysis patients, anecdotally, when you give someone intravenous iron, uh, you know, we see that they, they benefit, they talk about feeling better. Um, and, you know, I have a number of patients uh, in my transplant cohort who run a, a normal hemoglobin so a, within our target of 10 to 12 but technically would come as iron deficient who push to have a little bit of iron because they feel better when they have it but I um, again like Martin I have a bit more conservative a bit more cautious I don't want to be pushing their hemoglobins up beyond our sort of targets and exposing them uh, to risk so I think really what we want are more sophisticated ways of looking at this and um, reassuring ourselves with the data. Thanks. And, and Roberto, the, the hope had been the HIF stabilizers would allow us to more safely increase hemoglobin above that 10 to 12 threshold uh, and, and improve our patient's quality of life. Where, what do you think about the data that you've seen about the HIF stabilizers? in terms of their, their effectiveness of increasing hemoglobin, more importantly from the safety perspective? Uh, so for, from a safety perspective, uh, there are uh, uh, different studies, also meta-analysis showing that there is no substantial changes between uh, uh, if uh, prolyl hydroxylase and uh, ESA therapy. So the, the, the adverse event is uh, absolutely the same. Uh, once again, I think that uh, uh, play uh, a major role is played by uh, clinical conditional patients. So the com more comorbid patients are more exposed to risk, but this is independently from the anemia treatment that you are performing. And uh, uh, the other point is, uh, 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 again, I, I think about the, the dose that you use uh, for, uh, uh, for correcting anemia. I, I think this is the key because uh, there are also uh, some uh, uh, post-hoc analysis of those negative trials, like the TREAT, the CHOIR, showing that uh, the cardiovascular risk is not associated to high hemoglobin per se, but only in those patients that to reach hemoglobin require high ASA doses. So this is, I think, the, the, the two points that we should uh, bear in mind for uh, when, when we, do, we correct anemia in our patients. Thank you. So we've got some questions in the chat. And please, if you are listening and want to ask a question, please put them through. So, so Roberto, the first question is, uh, um, uh, the CKDAQ tool, is that is that specific for anemia of CKD? And if it is, uh, is that the only tool we have? 
so congratulations for the for the uh, I particularly acute uh, for <laughs> for looking at the, the the last one because uh, uh, it's right. This is the the only question this that has been developed starting from data of anemic patients with CKD. The problem is uh, that the, uh, has been developed in 2020, so we don't have yet data about uh, its validity in uh, in a larger population. But uh, I think it should be the, the the most promising one among the others. Okay, and, and a quick question following on from that. Do you use patient reported outcomes routinely in your clinical practice uh, in terms of almost auditing your uh, treatment um, within locally? So do you use those, uh, Roberto, in your, in your hospital? Uh, to say the truth, no. Because no, I think the, I think I know the answer. But we, have, we have the 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 strong problem of a, of a, of time with number yeah. of patients uh, referred to to our clinic. So uh, you 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 need about ten to twenty minutes for administering one questionnaire. So tomorrow morning I have a fifteen scheduled visit. It's quite impossible that also enough of them I can administer a questionnaire. And Sapna, how about at Kings? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I agree. It's the time. And so we, we don't routinely do it. I also think that um, it's worth mentioning that, you know, there are issues with lit patient literacy, language and, you know, ability to fill fill in those questionnaires. So I think that needs to be addressed. And I think, well, if I think we should start bringing them into clinical practice and I think we should bring in the simpler ones. And I particularly like the visual analog scales um, because I think patients find it easy to put a, put a mark somewhere on there. Um, but no, not routinely. I mean, in the UK, we are trying to collect some patient reported outcome measures for our CKD and dialysis patients uh, nationally. And it, it's always really interesting when those survey reports come through, but we're not doing it um, uh, you know, on a clinic basis, which we should be doing. Uh, Martin, is yeah. that something you do? Yeah, I can add to that, that uh, in the Netherlands, um, we have since five years, I think, structurally this nationally, national program of uh, collecting uh, PROM data from dialysis patients. So all dialysis hospitals in the Netherlands and centers actually collect these data. And uh, I think many of the reports that have been published uh, have been based on, uh, well, either the pilot study or the now routinely collected data. So I think that's, that's good. Um, at the same time, having said that, uh, we should be careful, I think, not to overinterpret um, uh, these uh, questionnaires. And of course, they should be a starting point, in my view, for a discussion with the patient on uh, how their symptoms are changing over time, if they're feeling better or worse. And it should be rather that that sh we should be discussing with the patient instead of just focusing on the, on the result of the test. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'm just thinking a patient coming to my clinic with their patient reported outcome form, I'm going to need to be trained <laughs> to know how I respond to the answers. <laughs> I can deal with the serum potassium and I can deal with the blood pressure, but if someone presents me with SF36 data or the uh, CKD AQ, I need to know what I'm going to do with it. So, so I think it is in essence a great idea for auditing practice and looking globally. If we go down to an individual basis, I think we're going to need to, certainly myself, uh, are going to need to know how we respond to those. And I think you're absolutely right. It's a change over time, isn't it? And whether things are getting better or worse uh, that we need to think about. Um, we've got some other questions. So just a point of clarification, Roberto, what would you suggest would constitute a low dose of ESA um, in terms of uh, your clinical practice? Uh, so for for non dialysis patients, uh, I think that the lower is a dose is a, is a, is a, if you talk about the darbepoetin, twenty to thirty maximum thirty microgram per uh, per week, and uh, the, the, this is corresponding for uh, to the uh, four thousand six thousand uh, uh, short acting uh, dose. If you treat patients, and it is a large majority of patients that receive this uh, this kind of uh, of doses, I don't believe there are a problem. For dialysis patients, of course, the as a as a need is much higher. But also in this case, uh, if you keep your patients uh, to a level below of uh, of uh, twelve thousand per week of short acting ASA, there is no uh, increase in the risk 
of a, of a cardiovascular mortality or morbidity. Thank you. And, and that veils on nicely to another question, which is really around cardiovascular risk in the chat, because we haven't actually done a cardiovascular outcomes study, have we, uh, with this data? These are analyses within the trials where the primary outcome has always been changing hemoglobin. And really, to, uh, to answer this question, we need to, if we wanted to think very clearly about cardiovascular risk, that should be the primary outcome for a study. But I think, Martin, get moving to, to, to your expertise, that study would look very different, I think, for a cardiovascular outcome study than a study looking at hemoglobin, wouldn't it, in terms of numbers of patients you'd need and how you would have to manage. And that would be a very different type of study that we'd need to deliver. Yeah, I fully agree. And um, uh, at the same time, of course, the design of the study would probably not be that different, of course, because patients still would have to be titrated towards a certain range of hemoglobin levels. Uh, so, well, my guess would be that eyeballing, looking at the data that we have in hand that were not initially uh, coming from trials that were designed to address these questions, but um, uh, based on what we have in hand, I would say that um, well, either would we need a really large population of patients to uh, get to a positive result or it would not well, would rather be a nil, uh, nil outcome or a negative outcome, so no difference because well, non-inferiority non -inferiority has been shown in several studies, uh, but in, in some studies, the balance has gone a little bit towards the adverse uh, direction instead of improvement. So um, I wouldn't be too convinced if such a trial would ever be performed. I think you're right. And I think we are going to have to deal with secondary analyses for their limitations. Yeah. Um, and, and Sapna, just someone's raised an interesting point here about patient reported outcomes, because when if I was to fill one of these in, I'd be thinking about how I felt today. And if I'd had a nightmare getting to work and, you know, I just had an argument with my teenage daughter and, you know, there were all sorts of <laughs> it might flavor how I feel. <laughs> how do you take into account, say, the HIF stabilizers where perhaps it's you don't need as much intravenous iron over a six to 12 month period? You're doing those things that impact in the quality of life but they aren't immediate and they're a bit more less tangible to put in things you know how would you approach that what what are your thoughts about that i mean there are there are different ways i mean we can collect the sort of clinical outcome things can't we so we can determine how many times the patients had to come up to hospital uh, for intravenous iron or prescriptions or for clinic visits etc and we can see whether there's any difference um, there is also, I think, asking that particular question to patients and trying to differentiate between not just quality of life, but how the treatment effect is and has it made a difference to them. I particularly liked, um, you know, again, the slides on the work aspect of things, because that I think has a big, you know, if you've got to come in for intravenous iron, you've got to take the day off work, that that's a tangible measure isn't it that you can that you can hone in on um so i think that you know those are some of the things you can think about but also i think it is also that repeated review of the patient over a period of time really getting to know your patient and understanding what they have been able to achieve or how their life has changed due to the treatment um that, that has been given that i think would be really useful here thanks and, and roberto this is a, a an impossible to answer question, which is why you're getting it. So if you were to design a study to correct anemia where the primary outcome was quality of life, how would you approach that study? What would what tools would you use and what would that study look like? Um, and where would you do it in hemo patients, PD? Would you do it in pre-dialysis patients? Where do you think would be the place you would go to first to try and really categorically prove uh, whether this this uh, correction of anemia does improve quality of life. I will start with the uh, non-dialysis population because uh, uh, this is, I think, the, the the population which you can ob obtain the better results because there is no, as you previously mentioned, the, the confounders or other uh, comorbidities that may mask the uh, uh, results that you can obtain. Uh, and also because uh, there is no uh, scientific proof, but uh, uh, from, from a pathophysiologic point of view, you can also expect that uh, an, 
improvement in anemia control may translate in a, a, a slowing down the progression of renal disease. So it's better to start earlier on this case uh, rather than uh, when patients is always on dialysis. Uh, which kind of study? Certainly a randomized trial. The problem is that you must analyze a lot, a lot, a lot of patients. This is the very, very big problem. And the, the really easy question, which Martin touched on, and Sapna has, how do you tease out the impact of the rising hemoglobin from, you know, where you talk about a placebo controlled trial? Where, how do you work out precisely what has caused that improvement in quality of life? Um, because we know, particularly for the HIF stabilizers, they have multiple different acts, um, aspects. Is it really important to tease them out, or is it just happy? We just happy quality of life has improved, and we don't necessarily need to dissect out the biochemical processes that achieve that. So, do you have an do you have a thought, Roberto, on that? Because if we did a quality of life. Actually, if we achieved an improvement, it wouldn't necessarily matter what hemoglobin range it was, because it would be very personal to that person in front, wouldn't in front of you, wouldn't it? Yeah, but I, I think that this is true if you if you uh, 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 if you uh, uh, treat the patients uh, overall. That is not just for hemoglobin increase. Because uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, forget always that when you increase hemoglobin uh, uh, without giving iron, uh, the, the, uh, of course, the, the benefits you may have on patients may, may be marked reduced. Uh, you make before the example of heart failure patients. Heart failure patients are those in which uh, there is a problem at mitochondrial level because there is no iron in the mitochondrial level. There is no energy production. Uh, and you can, you may risk that if you point exclusively on uh, hemoglobin correction and forget that uh, you must control very careful uh, transfer saturation, ferritin levels, and so obtain a, a, a more comprehensive approach to the uh, anemia correction, uh, you may miss your uh, your target. And I would factor in their quality of life as well, would, wouldn't you? As, as, as one of those facets to iron stores, to the things that you've mentioned, if you've achieved a quality of life for that patient, that may be enough that hemoglobin may not necessarily be the thing you would necessarily target to. I think what we've discussed is the real challenge of how we measure that. And I'm still not sure we have moved away from an experienced clinician who knows the patient who comes to see them and is able to tell whether we are improving that patient's quality of life or whether it's getting worse. And I, I tell my medical students, I can normally tell how a patient's doing by how they walk to my waiting room when I go and call them and the look on their face, the way they mobilize through. And if you know that patient, you have a pretty good idea before they sit down how things are. But I don't know how you capture that in a quantifiable way. So we're coming up to the end of time. It's been an absolutely fantastic discussion. And I'm just going to go around everyone for final thoughts, really. I'm really thinking about um, the role of quality of life in how we manage patients with anemia of CKD and where you think we might move to over the next five years in terms of developments. So starting with yourself, Roberto. Uh, so the the, uh, the lot of studies and data that are accumulating on this issue, uh, uh, I think, is uh, very useful for my point of view, for my clinical activity, because uh, uh, this is a point that has been highlighted. That so uh, it it improves my my care for uh, for patients. Uh, what I hope that will occur in the in the next future is uh, having uh, uh, shorter uh, uh, tools that can evaluate uh, the, and the, with, with which we can assess uh, the, the quality of life of our patients. And, and it's very difficult to develop other questionnaire and uh, validate uh, in, uh, in a different setting uh, uh, of CKD patients. Thank you. And Martin? 
Yeah, I think that we're living in an era where there are fantastic new opportunities to collect a lot more data, and not only on physical measurements and on laboratory measurements, but also on quality of life measurements. Um, and that shouldn't be really too much of an effort for patients if they can like um, provide these data while sitting at home uh, using an app uh, that directly sends the data into an electronic health record, and that we can use also uh, repeated measurements in, in, uh, in, in our research, but also in clinical practice. So I think if we uh, are able to collect a lot more data, we're hopefully able to learn a lot more about what really works for our patients. Thank you. And Sapna? Thank you. So I think what, you know, what we're hearing today is that, you know, there really is a bit of a paradigm shift in how we look after our patients from moving away from looking at blood results to really looking and honing in on their experience and their symptoms. Um, and I'd like to see us refine our tools for doing that, um, you know, make it more bespoke for anemia, work out how we're going to integrate that in the clinical pathways. Um, and that will help us to individualize our care for patients, which is, I think, the ultimate goal. Thank you. I couldn't agree with all of your comments uh, more, but I, but the final plea is for an old nephrologist like me is we need some training in how we're going to use these tools to manage patients on an individual basis. Because uh, I think it's absolutely right we should be collecting that data. Patient, my patients at home should be reporting how they're feeling uh, and whether I'm actually improving their quality of life. And quite frankly, I don't think I could tell you for sure I'm improving. I think I am. But actually, I, we often get surprised when we ask patients who often tell us what they think we want to hear. So I think there's a lot for us to learn, but it will uh, I'm absolutely sure it will in the fullness of time improve the care we deliver to our patients. So thank you again for some fantastic conversation. Thank you for joining us for this e-seminar.